You're listening to the Scotiabank Market Points podcast. I'm your host, Greg White. Market Points is part of the Knowledge Capital series, a collection of audio, video, and written commentary from Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets leaders designed to provide you with timely insights and analysis. In 2019, on the first anniversary of the Scotiabank Women Initiative, Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets launched its dedicated women initiative with bespoke programs focused on career and business acceleration for clients. GBM's initiative has now reached its own one-year anniversary milestone, and a big highlight for Scotiabankers and clients alike has been the Scotiabank Good Corporate Governance Program. On this episode of Market Points, I'm joined by Loretta Marcosia, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets. Loretta is the Executive Sponsor of GBM's Women Initiative. And also with us is Julie Walsh, Senior Vice President, Corporate Secretary and Chief Corporate Governance Officer for the bank. Julie runs Scotiabank's Good Corporate Governance Program. Loretta and Julie talk in detail about the initiative and how Scotiabank is building a pipeline of the most board-ready executives in Canada. Hi, Loretta. Hi, Julie. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Greg. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having us and great to be here with you both. Loretta, if we could start with you, what's the genesis here? How did the Scotiabank Women Initiative begin in the first place? How did global banking and markets uh, initiate its own program? And how is it unique? What is it made up of? And, And who is it meant to serve? The program itself was launched on December 5th, 2018 by Canadian Banking for commercial clients. In 2019, the Scotiabank Women Initiative was expanded into global banking and markets. And when we looked at our corporate clients, we knew that the program could be game changing, but that the challenges that our corporate clients faced were quite different than those of commercial clients. So we decided to go out to our clients and ask them what initiatives would support them and how Scotiabank could help them grow in their careers. And this is what's most unique about our program. It's rooted in the business and it was created in partnership with our clients. We're so proud to support women uh, from emerging leaders to senior executives in their pursuit for their best professional futures, as well as advancing the inclusion agenda in their companies. Uh, And we fashioned our program around three pillars, advisory, innovation, and education. And since the launch of our program, we've had many accomplishments uh, across these three pillars. And I'm I'm just going to give you a flavor of what those are. So as part of our innovation pillar, we hosted the uh, Diversity and Inclusion Roadshow, which raises awareness and provides insight into diversity inclusion for corporations um, and so that they can build a DNI strategy uh, into their overall strategy. We launched several ESG link notes and created a new custom equity link index uh, with a DNI tilt to be used for future offerings. And we partnered with Global Wealth Management for an internal Empowering Your Financial Future series that uh, they hosted uh, for internally for our, our women leaders. Secondly, the education pillar was designed to provide access to relevant forums to help empower and build subject matter expertise uh, for these emerging leaders. And we started out by hosting events and successfully uh, pivoted to hosting our Lean, Engage and Partner or LEAP series events in a virtual setting once COVID hit. Most recently, we hosted um, a successful LEAP series about ESG, our re-entry efforts and um, impact of LIBOR changes on our business and our clients. So those were three areas, again, ESG, which was is obviously very topical, re-entry efforts as, as, as it relates to COVID and how Scotiabank is addressing this, and of course, in LIBOR changes, which is um, you know, the cessation of these, these rates globally, which is changing our banking environment. And under our advisory pillar, we've curated, and the advisory pillar would be the third pillar. Um, and this is one that's designed really to help provide advice to our, our clients. And we've curated a comprehensive database of over 100 highly qualified women as solid candidates for corporate board seats. Uh, This database is a great tool to support clients that are looking uh, to diversify and strengthen their boards. Often when we're working with companies that are either merging or or potentially acquiring and they or they want to restructure their boards, this is a great database for us to have in in supporting those clients uh, who are looking to create diversity on the board. 
And, and in addition to that, and most significantly, I think, we hosted our inaugural Good Corporate Governance Program. And this is a bespoke program that's actually run by Julie, as she's our, our Chief Corporate Governance Officer here at Scotiabank. Um, this particular program provides top women clients with the opportunity to learn best practices and emerging trends while they're enhancing their skills and potential as a board director. These women are better prepared to play key roles on boards that they'll eventually join and be powerful advocates for Scotiabank when they take their board seats. So that's sort of the, the, the gist of our program, um, and hopefully that answers your question, Greg. Yes, absolutely it does. Thank you. Uh, and Julie is here, so we can dig in a little bit more on the corporate governance program and the initiative. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, past experiences baked in to the initiative. So Julie, can you perhaps start by talking a little bit about how governance has evolved within Scotiabank? I mean, one of the fascinating things about corporate governance is it's always evolving. It's it's never static and we're always looking to see how we can improve. And and that's one of the great things about Scotiabank is its commitment to strong corporate governance is is well recognized and well established. When I look back over the years, whether we were one of the first to adopt formal corporate governance policies or separating the roles of chairman and CEO, which we did 16 years ago. And, and over the years, whether it be adoption of a skills matrix, implementing term limits, and adopting a formal board diversity policy, which we did seven years ago and then have revised subsequently twice, um, it's a continued commitment to improvement, to recognizing we can always do better, and also recognizing those are the expectations of our organization to be leading, to not be responding to what we think is good governance, but to anticipating and be more forward thinking in our approach. And what I think is one of the unique things about Scotiabank and how we've approached governance over the years is it's not only about the parent bank. We, we send our proxy circular out every year to our shareholders, and, it, and it's very detailed talking about what we do. But it goes beyond that. And um, back in 2014, the bank created the Corporate Governance Office, which is quite unique and, and really was a market-leading practice among financial institutions and public companies at the time. And our Corporate Governance Office has a direct reporting line to the chairman as well as to management. And through the Corporate Governance Office, we've been able to really leverage not only the leading practices that we uh, adopt and utilize at the parent bank, but throughout our footprint. And that's really where we can have some substantive change. When we look at our footprint and in the markets where we're operating, we've been able to be a market leader, not only in Canada, but in Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Peru, our operations in GBM in the United States, England, Ireland, and throughout the Caribbean as well. Some of those practices I spoke about, such as skills matrices or term limits, corporate governance policies, in some of those markets, we were the first to put those in place. And it was a wonderful opportunity to draw on the experiences and the, and the institutional knowledge that we have at the bank and drive change, not only in Canada, but in other markets as well. And that was really quite unique and I think a great opportunity. And it, and it also speaks to the, how we have approached what we think is good governance. And then that in turn has also led to one of the initiatives our corporate governance office launched a while ago, which were director colleges. And what those have been have been programs that we've run in the bank for not only our internal officers who serve as directors on our subsidiaries, but we've also run programs on governance and director's duties for all of our boards throughout our footprint. And that really was a program that was not only unique for the opportunities and how we were trying to break down what is good governance, what are director's duties, how do people realize, especially if you're a member of management, which hat you're wearing at what time, how to approach director's duties and how to be able to maximize your contributions to a board for the betterment of that company, but also for your own professional development, how to look at this and, and what you can draw on to get more out of it. But then that really was a program that we were able to leverage with our colleagues in GBM, with Loretta and our other colleagues, and saying, how can we build on this now, not just for internal purposes at Scotiabank, but how can we take it further? And that was the beginning of our discussions about our good corporate governance program for GBM. 
on how we could use this program as a bit of a base um, and push it out beyond our subsidiaries, um, but to use it for our clients to talk about what does it mean to be a director? What does effective and good governance really look like? And, and that was the beginning of the discussions that ultimately led to the inception of the program that we launched last year. What about board diversity? Because, of course, all of the, these programs are under the Women Initiative, and it's meant to address a real imbalance in, in corporate boards across the country and, and globally. Uh, so what is Scotiabank's own record with respect to balance and diversity uh, when it comes to governance? Thanks, Greg. I mean, Scotiabank has long been committed to board diversity. And when I look back over the last 10 and 15 years, we have really taken great strides to steadily increase the diversity of our board, not only at the parent board, but throughout the organization and also on our subsidiary boards. And I think that's really important to, to recognize because so much attention these days is paid to public companies and to the directors on the parent board. And that is absolutely critical. It totally is in the public company context. But we look at it broader than that. We, we've we had over 20% women on our parent board of directors going back to 20, 2004. And, and over the last four years, we've consistently had over 30% women on our parent company board of directors. And we're very proud of that at Scotiabank. But it goes farther than that not only throughout our organization and our commitment to diversity within the organization, it's into our communities where we also have our subsidiaries. And whether I look at in Latin America, at Mexico and Chile, in Colombia and Peru, where we've had over 20 or 30 percent women on those subsidiary boards, where we're big players in those markets for some time. And going into the Caribbean, we, we've been over 40% in Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica, and both of our subsidiaries there are publicly traded. And then among our Canadian subsidiaries, both at Scotia Capital and Tangerine, we've had 50% or more women on those boards. And that's where you really get this impact. That's where we build this pipeline. So it's at the parent board, it's throughout our footprint in the markets and the communities where we operate. And now we're taking that to our clients. And the community impact that we're going to have for companies across Canada and beyond, I think that that holistic approach that we've taken, that's where it's a real differentiator and that's where we can have great impact. And I think just furthers our long held commitment to board diversity. So you've 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 packaged all of this knowledge and experience into the good corporate governance program. Um, and can you talk a little bit? though, about how it practically uh, prepares individuals to be highly effective board members? What will individuals actually be learning in the program? There's a lot that we learn, but I think we have to go back to the beginning and some of the first principles that Lo Loretta spoke about as well, which was we took feedback from our clients on what do you think would be a value? How can we make a difference to you and for what you think people might be interested in learning about? And what would that forum be? So we particularly, in particular, we, we started this off as a bespoke program. It's small, it's tailored, it's a small group uh, setting, which I think is really great if you're going to have candid discussions about some, some difficult topics. And it's not difficult because they're intellectually uh, challenging. It's more, how do you how do you wade through all of this and how do you apply it and think about it practically, both for your own organization, maybe at this time, and also what you're looking forward to in the future? So, so some nuts and bolts that we really cover, we go back to the beginning, we go back to some first principles, looking at director's duties. What are director's duties? And for many people in our program, they're currently senior officers in their organization. So thinking about what's the role of a board? What's the role of management? How are they distinct? And, and sometimes what can the situations be where maybe those lines can get a little blurred and how do you look through that? So one of the things we aim to do is not only help people as they think in the future about what it might mean to be a director, but also maybe better understand the role of, of board members in their own organizations, how they're engaging with them, how directors are looking at information, how management is, ultimately with a view to also helping them better succeed and present um, and be compelling in their own boardrooms at, this per, at, this, at the juncture they might be at right now. So after we move on from director's duties, then we look at sort of what does the nomination process look like for directors? How does that all work? And, and sort of demystifying and also talking about expectations and what should you look at and how might you approach this process? 
And I think that's really important as well for, for women when we're talking about diversity and we're talking about skills and we're talking about how a board is assessing you, but also how are you assessing that board? Because it's a two-way conversation. So, so talking through that and helping people think about not only how they might be approaching a board search, but also in turn how a board might be looking at them. We then talked about um, going through the nomination process onto joining a board. What does that look like? What does an orientation look like? What, what should you expect and maybe what you should ask for as part of that so that you can get up the curve as quickly as possible with, with a view to making good contributions? And from there, we really moved on to contribution. And what does it look like? How do you engage with directors and management? You've taken on this new role. You're well accustomed and very successful in your role as management. But as you move on now to a directorship, how do you engage individually and collectively with your fellow board members with a view to, over time, making an impact? So we try to look at, at different parts of this journey of assessing board memberships and deciding, really, is this what you want and, and why is that? And how to approach not only the nomination process, um, but all the way through to taking a seat at the boardroom table and um, and getting comfortable there and, and looking at good board dynamics. What does that mean? What, your, what is your role, the role of others? And really going through this, this whole process together in that small group format, which really we were trying to ensure would be conducive to facilitating those candid discussions and establishing that peer network among all of our participants. That is a, a lot accomplished in uh, only one year. Loretta, what are you looking forward to in the future for the program? What's what's next? Following Julie on, on what she's just mentioned, I just wanted to add to, to what she said, given that we've had now one cohort go through the program and the comments that we had coming back was just how practical um, the information was and, and they could put it into play. So, it, it, you know, there's many programs out there that are designed to give you information about boards and get you ready for boards. But that practicality of someone who actually does do and works as a corporate secretary who's focused on governance, that experience, that real life experience was really what made the difference on this course. You know, Julie's our secret sauce. Uh, as it relates to the program. And so when we talk about the future, this is one area that I think is just really going to take off for us. It's super important out there in, in the corporate world, given that, you know, diversity on boards, um, having diversity in general in organizations, but particularly on boards from a governance perspective, um, but also the social side of that, the social responsible side of, of making sure that you do have a diverse group that are governing organizations. For us, this is going to be, uh, a, it is a game changer. It has already been. It's unique to us. Um, having the practical program and, and a formal program around it, we're looking to leverage that. The virtual environment was interesting, and Julie did a great job in pivoting to talking about what it means to be a board under virtual circumstances and, and how do you do governance, you know, not in person. And so she, she, we did our final session of the last program virtually, and, and she spoke specifically to that about an AGM, having a virtual AGM. And, and that really brought, again, that practical element and real-life circumstance to it. So this is something we're looking to leverage in the future. With the virtual opportunity, we can take it across Canada and globally where before we would have been challenged because we only have one Julie. So that that's an important element of the future. And obviously, the, the entire ESG space and continuing to build product and education um, as, as well as advice focused around that. You've been listening to Loretta Marcosia, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets, and Julie Walsh, Senior Vice President, Corporate Secretary and Chief Corporate Governance Officer for Scotiabank. You can now find Scotiabank's Market Points on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And we want to hear from you. Please rate and review the show. Your feedback helps us improve the content we create for you. You'll find more thought-leading content on our website, gbm.scotiabank.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at ScotiabankGBM, as well as our LinkedIn showcase page under Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets. Please refer to our legal disclosures on our website. I'm Greg White. Thanks for listening.